Well, as we always do, um, because we need our Lord's help and care and support and direction, we're going to open going before him in prayer uh, before we open up his word. So would you pray with me, church, as we begin our time in the word together? Father, we're thankful, Lord, just for another week to learn more really essential things that you reveal in your word for our good, for our upbuilding, for our awareness about you and about how you work and about who you are and about your mercy and grace, things that we've sung about already, but also that we might see it in your word. We're thankful, Lord, that you are the great healer. We're thankful that you're the great rescuer. We're thankful that you are the great savior. The evidence of that is even right here in this room, Lord, as we could look around and we could see believers bought by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, here to hear the word because of the work that you've done in rescuing them in your life. And so we are just so thankful for your work in our lives and we want more of it. We want more of it in your word as we open it, as we see it. Lord, so would you feed us today? Would you give us what we need? Lord, because we know that we don't live on bread alone, but we, we live on every word that you've revealed in your word. And so give us some more. We need your sustenance. We need your strength. We need your love and mercy and care. We need your deliverance. We need your rescue. Would you do a work in all of our hearts? Father, and I pray specifically for anybody who's here that may not, not yet know the good news of the gospel of your son, who may still be blind to the things that you reveal, Lord, that you might even do a mighty, miraculous work in opening up their eyes and hearts to the things that you reveal, the good news gospel found in the word. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, after recently finishing uh, our spiritual warfare, Christian's armor sermon series through Ephesians 6. Uh, It's been on my mind. I've been thinking a whole lot about the miraculous and mighty works and deeds of King Jesus. And not only just the mighty works that he did, as you could learn through the Gospels. Uh, For instance, just to start off that whole, you know, virgin birth Thing, which is just an amazing thing that we witness in the life of Jesus, but then also his perfect and sinless life. When we know all the sins that bombard us in this world, to know that there was a man who lived his whole life without any sin is amazing. And then when we get into Jesus' just penetrating teaching right to our hearts through his parables and sermons, uh, Jesus is just so amazing. His compassionate healings his powerful and sovereign control over all of creation. And then even those miracles that are a little bit kind of hard to categorize, those miracles of the feeding of the thousands or the walking on the water or the multiplying of wine at the wedding and so on. I mean, the list is long in Jesus' amazing mighty works. His resume is top notch. But there's been one area specifically in this series on Ephesians 6 that has particularly just struck me as of late as I've been thinking about it through that specific series, and that is Jesus' authority over evil spirits, demons, and his authority and power over Satan himself. And since we've been recently thinking about what the scriptures reveal in Ephesians 6, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities and the principalities of the evil uh, places in this unseen battle. Since that's been on our mind, I want us to be able to see a real clear and powerful picture of King Jesus' authority over that. And he better have authority over that, right? If, if that is the real picture of our world today, this unseen battle. We better hope that Jesus has authority over the demons and and over Satan in that way. For we live in a world, as we all know, where Satan is said to be the God, little g, and father 
of unbelievers. And that unbelievers are not following God, but what? They're following the devil. And the devil, along with his demons, you see, are also actively strategizing to blind unbelievers to every good and spiritual thing. Why? Because they're in opposition to God by very nature. They want to keep people from seeing God. Do you see that? And we see evidence all around us of that very fact, don't we? Because there are so many confused and lost and hurting people in the world. We see them and we know them. We see their blind spiritual condition. And so many in our world that are just downtrodden and just utterly hopeless for various different difficult and sad reasons. And we see in our world some people even hooked on all types of forms to try to make them happy or drugs or things of that nature to cope with their problems. Maybe you've known people that have gone that way. Maybe you know people who are hooked that way. We see this in the world, and it's sad. Others, we don't see this often in our context, but you got to realize this. There are people throughout the heathen nations that are actively and actually worshiping, you know, uh, idols and, and people that actually worship the devil and the satan, satanic and demonic things and rituals and such. That happens in our world, even if it's on the fringes, uh, not always on the news or not always right in front of us, but there are people that are that bad off in situations that are so far gone. And we can, when we look at people like that or hear about people like that, you know, we, we'd be afraid to approach some people and, and we can also kind of write them off as very little or no hope whatsoever. And, and you know, if, if, it, if it has to do with us, sometimes we might move, move beyond, uh, pass over uh, and ignore somebody who's in that kind of a situation. But we've got to see that that is a reality in our day and age. But what we most naturally and more frequently see in, the, in, our, in our context, in our situation, is unbelievers that might seem like they've got it all together. So whether we have unbelieving coworkers and friends or family members who are unsaved or friends that we keep in touch with, you know, on social media from high school that we go way, you know, way back with, but then you just know that they, they don't love God. There's not a, a spiritual inclination to love and worship God. They're, they're not pursuing Jesus. Christ is not... His, their, their Lord and Savior and Master, they're apparently blind to the things of God, spiritually heartless. Yeah, maybe they not, might not be worshiping the devil and the demonic, and maybe they don't dress up like somebody who's dark and deep and evil, but you know, by their very life and talking to them, they're not living for God to glorify Him. The gospel is not sweet to them. They are unsaved as well. And in light of all this in this world, we can get discouraged because of that. And even we can get tempted to give up hope for people in this situation. And we could also stop our attempts to engage and help and share with them. Why? Because they are just too far gone. Have you ever felt that or thought that? What's the use? So many failed conversations we've had. Even some of them kind of make giving a, a moratorium on God talk or spiritual things. They don't even want to hear it. They told you they don't want to hear it. They're not having, they, they, they've forbidden the very topic of talking about God. And, and sometimes we can go along the ways of thinking, okay, um, we're just, I'm not, we're going to take them at their word and disregard them as uninterested and mark them off our list as people who need to be evangelized. And we may pass them over in our discouragement in the failures, the supposed failures that, that we feel, and we could move on and go about our lives. But let me remind us all today that Jesus is mighty and powerful to save even the most lost and destitute of sinners. And, and he even does that. He has a purpose in doing that. Why? So that they might in their transformation be witnesses to the world because the more bleak the situation is, let me show us today, the more evident that God is involved if something changed because that's the only thing that explains something like that. And we're going to look at one of those said bleak situations today from our passage 
To see a man who was more lost than anyone that you or I have ever known or even thought about. A man who was more hopeless and downtrodden than anything you or I have experienced. A man who was more isolated, alone, and destitute of any good thing. This is a man that if you saw him, you would just bolt in the other direction. You'd run away. You'd be, you'd be fearful. That is how bad off this guy was. So turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 8, as you see on the screen, and verses 26 through 29 to see here right off the bat that Jesus goes, Jesus goes to the most vile and lost of sinners. Let's see that in our passage. Let's see Jesus going to them. In verse 26, it says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus goes to the most vile and lost of sinners. And we see that here, right? Right off the bat in our text. Jesus rides up on the boat and meets this guy on the shore, or rather, this this man meets him on the shore. And this man was, as those in the South would say, in a bad way, wasn't he? I mean, we just read about it. He's in a bad condition. He was demon-possessed, naked, homeless, crying, even cutting himself with stones, as the parallel passage in Mark 5 tells us. So this guy was bloodied, bruised, living in a graveyard amongst dead bodies in the tombs, ostracized by people, as you can imagine, chained up, as we just read, only to break out of those chains. I think it's really safe to say that this guy qualifies as someone who's in a vile and lost and terrible, desperate situation, right? That's kind of the exact definition of the demoniac here. But what what does Jesus do? Jesus goes straight to him. So I ask you to consider again, have you ever thought that someone was so bad off that you thought that they were just unsavable? (laughs) I think I'd be right to venture to say here that most of us have not run into somebody in this bad a situation. And he's at the top of the list if we just read about him and learn about the demoniac. Or to make it even more personal here for all of us, have you ever thought that you in your life were in such a situation that was so complicated and too messed up to be fixed. Maybe not with all the dramatic, uh, extreme situations of the demoniac, but your circumstances and situations, maybe there's just too many problems in, in the family. Maybe just too much going on and one thing after another, just too much to fix it. Or maybe you've been in work situations that just seem so messy kind of entangled with a difficult boss and coworkers, too much to fix, and you just feel like giving up and moving on or just just figuring out how to cope in a really bad situation because it's not going to get any better. Or maybe there are some marriages sometimes that can have a dry spell. Maybe you've been in that or, or going through that. Maybe now or maybe... Maybe that it feels like it's on the rocks. Maybe it feels like it's irreconcilable. So overwhelming. So many struggles. Things are bad. Whatever topic it could be, we can be overwhelmed by that. And it is overwhelming for understandable reasons. But I want us to consider this man and his terrible situation. And then the whole point for us this morning here from this passage is to consider Jesus and how great Jesus is, and he is, and what he does for this man. He can 
by the grace and working of God do to you and do to others in your life as well. What Jesus did was amazing. But what did Jesus do for him? That's what we need to see in our text. Jesus rode up on a boat directly to the shore to help this desperate man. Look with me again at verse 28 to just see this picture of Jesus and the demoniac. In verse 28 it says, When he saw Jesus, talking about the demoniac, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. This demon-possessed man is confronting Jesus there at the shore because these demons that indwelt him were within him and possessing him. They were the reason why this man was in such a terrible and bleak and dire situation. They were why he was so bad off. And they addressed Jesus because they were afraid of Jesus. The demons, they said, as you saw there, do not torment me. They came right to Jesus, fearful of Jesus. Do you see that? Because they feared, the demons they did, that they might be thrown into hell before the final judgment before their time. And they might not have the ability to roam around to and fro as they apparently were, causing havoc that they so loved in terms of their evil to inflict on others. And just get this, get this picture. The demons, the dark and evil beings were afraid of Jesus. The people we'd be afraid of, the, a man like that, that would be, we, we'd be like, ah, this scenario was flipped. They were afraid of Jesus. Jesus isn't bloodied and that way, but they're afraid of him. And notice the demons within this man knew exactly who Jesus was. There was no question to them who Jesus was. You saw it, right? It said, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. That's a great proclamation of the divinity of Jesus. That's what they said. The demons within this man knew who Jesus was. <laughs> Many commentators point out the irony here that the demons knew exactly who Jesus was when the disciples kind of over and over again were confused about Jesus' true identity throughout his whole ministry. But the, the demons knew who he was. And we ex see example of the disciples confusion right before our text, and I want us to see it before that he rides up onto the shore, before our text is in uh, Luke 8, 22 through 25, to see an example of the disciples and their confusion about Jesus. It says, one day he got into the boat with the disciples and he said to them, let us go across the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus fell asleep there, and a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid. And they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him? You see the disciples there? They're like, who is this guy? Who's able to just stop the storm by a word? All this chaos. And he just wakes up from a nap and puts it all right. Who is this guy? The demons, on the other hand, knew exactly who Jesus was. But the disciples are like, I, I, don't, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Who is this guy? You see that contrast. So if the demons knew so well who Jesus was, Here's my question for us all. Why, oh why in the world, did they come down the bank to meet Jesus if they were so afraid of Jesus? You'd think that when the demons saw this powerful Jesus coming, they're afraid of him, that they'd run in the other direction, kind of playing hide and seek with Jesus. I'm gonna run across, hide in the tombs, get away from Jesus. But in this situation, Instead of running away and fleeing, they came down to him. Why would they come down to him? You ever thought about that? I believe the reason is because Jesus and his sovereign plan that day compelled them. Jesus 
in his work to meet this man is the only thing that explains this because if the demons had their way, they would run in the other direction. But this man comes to Jesus on the shore because of the great control that Jesus has as Jesus intentionally had a plan to meet that man that day. There are no accidental meetings. Uh, We know that especially from King Jesus' ministry, everything that Jesus does is intentional. He's not just random. It's not just willy-nilly. He was there that day to rescue this hopeless man according to his will. You see that? Can you see the compassion in Jesus going straight to this poor man? Most of us would go the other way, walk past him, ignore him, but he goes to them. Look, that's a compassionate savior, right? Jesus doesn't run away from him or try to lock him up like everybody else in the town. Like, he's scary, lock him up, put him under lock and chain. No, Jesus goes straight to him. He goes to this mess of a man in a terrible situation, scary to even approach, and reprehensible to even look at, a man who's isolated, but Jesus doesn't cringe at the sight of him. You see that? But Jesus goes to him, even in all his wildness. I think it's safe to assume from this and see from this that there is no one in the world who is so bad off that Jesus wouldn't or couldn't go to. Isn't that an important thing to see here? And he doesn't just go to him. He also, he's going there to him to help him. And this leads us to our next point, number two. Jesus is even mighty to deliver from the darkest of situations. Look with me now, just to see at verse 30, to see the beginning of this. It says in Luke 8 and verse 30, Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion. For many demons had entered him. So as Jesus in this showdown confronts the demoniac, confronting these demons that he knew about, wasn't a surprise to him. He knew what was wrong with this guy. And those demons kind of speaking through this man said that his name was Legion because many, many demons had entered him. Now, a legion of soldiers during that time was well over 6,000 men. And in Mark's gospel account, it actually says that there were 2,000 pigs that were drowned that day, and we're going to see the the pig situation in a moment. Now, the precise number, though, just to be clear, uh, is not really the point of this text. The, The Bible doesn't tell us how many specific demons there were, but what we get here clearly is that this man had many, many demons in this one man. It was a terrible place and situation for him to be in. It's almost too hard for us or impossible for us to fully fathom how bad off this guy was. He quite possibly could have been in the history of the world, in the history of all mankind, everyone in the past to today and into the future. Maybe he may possibly be a person who's in the worst condition, if we could quantify it, the most lost, the most destitute, the most far gone than anyone else in the history of the world. This guy had a ton of demons dwelling in him. Just see the poor guy. It's a terrible situation because of the demonic wholesale takeover of his life. But what happens next after the demons fearfully address Jesus and Jesus finds out the demoniac and the name Legion. What happens next? Look with me in your Bibles to verses 31 through 33 for this. It says, and they begged him, talking about the demons, not to command them to depart into the abyss. Do you see that? That judgment before their time. Don't, don't send me there. Now, uh, it goes on in verse 32. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him to let them enter these So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herds rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. So we see here Jesus delivering this poor man from the worst of all possible situations. 
and cast the demons out of the man into the pigs by his very command or sovereign will or permission and plan. Sure, we just read it, right? Sure, the demons asked Jesus to go into the pigs. But let me just point out this. The demons were not recommending these kinds of things until they saw Jesus coming and they saw the writing on the wall, okay? This guy was in a dark situation with those demons, and if Jesus wasn't there on that shore that day, that man would have continued with those demons and dwelling him in suffering, in terror, possessed by these demons. Those demons weren't going anywhere without Jesus coming to the scene. So you see here, even though the, the demons asked permission, this was because Jesus is powerful and sovereign, and they knew what was up. They knew who he was. They knew what was coming. And so they asked to be gone into the pigs. He delivers this man. I want us to see, in terms of the contrast between the demons and the dark and things of that nature and Jesus, I want us to see in this deliver the deliverance of the man, in this showdown, that our King Jesus has no match. Do you see that? Demons, even a ridiculously large multitude of them, or even Satan himself, their great powerful general, is no match for Jesus as we see here. Years ago, before we had any sons, and it was just me and my two oldest daughters, um, back then, I'll just say this, our house was just as all girly as you would expect. Barbie dolls, uh, princess movies, all those things. And that was great. We, I, I enjoyed that. It was fun. I'm dad to the girls. And that's kind of what you'd expect. But there was a game-changing moment in the history of our family, monumental, at least for us. You, you probably don't know about it. Actually, I may have mentioned it before. I think I have. But there was a game-changing moment when we went from only, you know, princess and, and girly type kids movies to that wonderful day when we introduced Star Wars to our kids. Now, there was no... <laughs> yes! Absolutely. This is for you guys. This is for you kids. So, th there was no guaranteeing that they would have been excited about that and saying yes uh, like that, because not all kids get into Star Wars, okay? So, I saw this as a kind providence of God, uh, blessing our family with some new uh, entertainment and fun. And so we'd watch those movies, and if you remember in the original trilogy, the emperor, emperor pale face, hood over his head, lightning bolts coming out of his hands, and he'd be going after Luke Skywalker in those movies in this great, you know, battle of the wits and power, and you just never knew which side would win. The emperor's going, is Luke gonna die? Uh, you know, it all, you always, uh, on edge, you always didn't know, this was a Wit, you know, battle of the wits, kind of like a 50-50 coin flip. It could go either way. And with that scary emperor that really spooked my kids, we had to skip those scenes in the past. Uh, now they're okay with them. But with that scary emperor, you just didn't know, was the good side going to win, the bad side going to win? But, but as we see here with Jesus, this, this is not the way it is with Jesus. Not at all. It, it's not like Jesus comes up to the shore and there's this battle with the demons and this legion of demons and this terrible situations. And it's just, you know, who's going to win? What's going to happen? They knew it before it even started. They didn't even try. No lightning bolts through the fingers. No, you know, theatrics. No nothing. I don't care if it's a legion of demons. They were no match to King Jesus. And as we saw in our recent Ephesians 6 series, we don't want to ignore or think about Satan and demons in kind of a comic book fairy tale way that, that our, our world could sometimes portray because that trivializes the evil realm, and it's not some made-up fairy tale, because Satan and demons in the evil realm are real, and we need to be aware of Satan's devices and strategies as we were seeing, the danger that he can cause, we recognize the threat, but I don't want you to be just crippled by fear over the dark realm, because Satan is, as we see here, no match for King Jesus, he's no match for God. He's nowhere close to the equal of God. There's no 50-50 split. Our triune God is omnipotent, which means that he's all-powerful. Satan and the demons, on the other hand, are finite, created beings. They don't have all power. God is omniscient, which means that he knows all things. Satan and demons 
aren't omniscient. They only know some things, like all the other created beings, because they are created. God is omnipresent, which is, means he's everywhere present with us. We know he's there. He's, he's with us. Satan and his demons are not everywhere present. They're only at one place at one time, limited. God is unlimited. Satan is limited. A created being, created by who? God. And he's no match for our great God. You see that, right? We should have confidence in seeing this showdown and knowing about God and what the Bible reveals, especially as believers, because we have a holy, magnificent, powerful God. Let us strengthen in our faith and trust in him. Because even though this man was overcome with the demonic, these demons weren't a roadblock for Jesus, were they? As he eliminated their threat by removing them from this man, and that is an amazing thing. And, and we want to see what happened next to this man as we're following along in his story, and that's going to lead us to verses 34 through 36 to see what happened next to this man. And verse 34 says this, when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. I don't think it's possible to overestimate here how glorious this wholesale transformation of this man really was. Like I said, maybe the biggest turnaround in the history of the world. This guy goes from a demon-possessed guy by likely thousands of demons, naked, homeless, despairing, living in a graveyard, segregating for family and friends, as we've seen. And now this guy is a Christian. He's saved now. He's a new man with a new heart, all because of what Jesus did for him. I just want to praise God for the miraculous conversion story that we're reading in Luke 8. The conversion of the demoniac. Isn't that an, a glorious, wonderful thing? Now, you think in this wonderful conversion story and transformation, you'd think that in Jesus casting out the demons of this well-known crazy guy in town, this madman, you'd think that people who witnessed that kind of thing and that turnaround would rejoice and be thankful, wouldn't you? You'd think people, wow. Amazing. Praise God. Wonderful. Praise. Even if they weren't Christians, they'd be like, wow. You'd think that they might see something there, and maybe they'd be intrigued in the God and what he did. But you see, that didn't happen. And let's see how they responded in verse 37. It says in verse 37, to see how the people responded, it says, Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So they got out of the boat and returned. And so we see here how non-Christians respond to Jesus. Unbelievers don't rejoice at the work of God, do they? Because they don't understand it. They turn away from it. Do you see what they just did there? Instead of rejoicing over the deliverance of this crazy guy, they kicked Jesus out of their town. They gave Jesus the boot. Out of here. We don't, we're afraid of this. Get out of here, Jesus. They wanted Jesus gone. Isn't that a terribly sad response? They were fearful, not of the demoniac anymore, because he's okay, he's not a threat anymore, but they're fearful of Jesus. They didn't love what Jesus did. Maybe because of the monetary loss of the pigs, maybe because they couldn't just fathom the change. With hard hearts, with unbelieving hearts, whatever it was, they, they saw Jesus' ministry, compassion and power, and they were afraid of it, and they didn't like it. They didn't rejoice in the conversion and the transformation of this demoniac. That's how unbelievers respond to Jesus. If they remain with their hard and unrepentant hearts, their blind eyes, they won't respond positively to anything that Jesus did and does. They should be worshiping and rejoicing because of the transformation. I mean, this is the guy that they were tying up and kicking out because he's crazy and unpredictable and dangerous. They should be rejoicing, but instead of rejoicing at the deliverance, they want Jesus to leave out of fear. Get out of here, Jesus. Shoo, please leave. 
because they have no spiritual eyes to see what Jesus did. They just didn't get it. They, they, they couldn't glory in it. They couldn't be happy about it. Do you get it? Do you know and love Jesus here with us this morning? Do you love his work, what he does? Do you love seeing people get saved and transformed? Do you love seeing people grow? Do you love praying together, spiritual things? Do you love hearing the preached word of God? Even the harder to hear passages, you know, that kind of go against the cultural status quo. Do you love studying the scriptures on your own? And seeing God work in the world, if you do, praise God. That means you're a believer. That's what Christians do. Or, on the other hand, if you're to be honest with yourself, does it sometimes bother you or embarrass you when spiritual things happen? Kind of annoy you. I remember prior to my conversion at 18, I had a profession of faith, grew up in the church, but whenever there was a prayer service, whenever I was in a prayer service as a professing Christian, I thought I was a Christian, but when there was a prayer service and people were praying, pouring out their hearts, all I could do was nitpick what people were saying and how they were saying it and how passionate they got. And in my heart, even though I wouldn't say it, I, I, was, I kind of was repulsed by the things of God. And if I was ever confronted with real gospel reality or teaching, I kind of went away from it because even though I had a profession of faith, I didn't have new spiritual life. I didn't love the things of Jesus even though I said that I did. And so... Where are you at with this, if you're honest? Does it bother or annoy you? Does it repel you? Do certain teachings of the Bible, maybe, for instance, on the topic of you know, human sexuality, what does the Bible teach on that? Does it kind of embarrass you? You're like, oh, don't say that. Oh, I don't want to see that. Oh, I don't really agree with that. Do some of the hard things in Scripture kind of like, you'd rather explain it away, ignore it, pretend it wasn't there. Is that where you're at? If that is the case for you, I would suggest that even if you claim to be religious, that you are acting and you are more like these townspeople kicking Jesus out of the city because they didn't want anything to do with him in his ministry. Even if you say, I like Jesus, he's great, I go to church, I'm a Christian, I'm a member. But, but if you don't really love the things he does and the things that is revealed in the word, what is that revealing about your hearts? It's revealing that you're more like these townspeople kicking Jesus out. No. Nope. That's nice, you did your thing, get out now. I don't, want, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm not interested with that. <laughs> because, you know, certainly some people in this town would have been respectable, kind of even religious type people. I mean, think about the Pharisees. They're about as religious as you can get. But as we saw in our Matthew series, Jesus continues to be met at every step with opposition from religious Pharisees who were enemies of Jesus, fighting against his ministry while they went and acted like they worshiped and they loved God. So even people in that situation could, could respond this way. And I want us to see that it is so evil for the town to respond to the mighty work of Jesus in that way. How evil is it for them to do that? How confused, how off, but also... It's also very, very revealing if we find ourselves or we see people today responding to spiritual ministry in opposition at every step of the way. Because make no mistake about it, the way that we respond to Jesus' ministry or even biblical ministry that we see today reveals where we're really at, whether we say and put on a certain front or not. So I want to see here how this demon-possessed man, in closing, responded to Jesus' ministry to him. We saw him transformed. We saw him go from demon-possessed to now the demons are gone. Now we see them, he's with Jesus, and okay, what, what's next? How does he respond after that moment? Let's see it in point number three. Jesus makes, get this, missionaries out of those he transforms. Even missionaries out of crazy, wild people like the demoniac. Let's see it in verses 38 through 39. This is so glorious. It says, the man from whom the demons had gone begged this guy, the demoniac, the former demoniac, that he might be with him. He wants to be with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. You see that? Oh, what a transformation of this guy. He wants to be with Jesus and follow him around like the disciples in his earthly ministry. He wants to follow him around like the other disciples. And can you blame him? He was homeless and had nowhere to go, no one to help him. And then Jesus helped him, delivered him, transforms him like no one else could do for him. 
this guy is saved now, a believer, is an eager disciple of Christ, and he just wants to follow Jesus around and be with him. But notice that Jesus had other plans for him. Did you see that? Plans to make him a witness and a missionary, even to the very lost people in that area that opposed him and were afraid of him, even at that very moment. For certainly in the surrounding area here, uh, there would be people that he would go to preach the gospel to and share what Jesus had done for him, some of them who were the very same people chaining him up out of fear only days before, wanting nothing to do with him. Maybe some of the same people who were kicking Jesus out also because of their fear. Now Jesus is sending, look at how compassionate he is. He's sending them a witness in this former demoniac. Now this is not your typical picture of a missionary, right? When you think about who would be a missionary or who would be a minister or who would be a You don't think of this kind of guy. But you see here, even the people we think are the hardest to reach, who knows how God might use you to share biblical truth, if they might be saved, to make an amazing impact on those around you. This is not your typical missionary, this demoniac. (laughs) But he does what Jesus commands him, and he obediently goes and tells other people all that Jesus has done for him. This once crazy guy is now a missionary, a witness to Jesus to the people. And it's just crazy to see the contrast of the ones who were just chaining him up days ago, wanting nothing to do with him, sending him to the tombs, isolating him, or the very same ones who are going to be witnessed by this former demoniac. He was naked and bloodied before in a terrible situation. It's just wild to think about. It's kind of crazy how the Lord works, right? We've got to see that. God works in amazing and mysterious and powerful ways, even ways that we could never predict, even ways we'd never come up with. And notice also these townspeople were the ones who were now in the dark place. They were always in the dark place, but in the story you see, oh, they're the ones in the dark. As they're chaining them up, you think, oh, they're just good, upstanding people, you know, trying to save themselves from this crazy guy. But they're in the dark. This former demoniac who once was in the dark is now saved, and they, the townspeople, are the ones in the dark, rejecting and kicking the Savior of the world out. (laughs) They are the ones who need the saving. The upstanding people who have it all together, they're the ones who need the saving. The former demoniac was going to be the one who shares the gospel with them. Now, you can understand a town and them wanting this crazy man out for fear of danger and, you know, the unpredictability uh, of this man and and all the things that were going on. You could kind of get out of fear that they'd want him out, but then you see... They also wanted Jesus out of the town. And then when this guy was delivered and saved, they didn't even want anything to do with that whole thing. They didn't even care because of fear and unbelief. They were the unbelievers. Just like the demoniac was, but they were just more respectable and less obviously lost than the demoniac. But they were still unbelievers, upstanding citizens of the town. They looked fine on the outside but they were in the dark, not glorying in the work of Christ. They're in this dark spiritual place, and they don't even see it. They think that the demoniac and Jesus, they're the the ones who need the saving. Really, anything that inconvenienced them was not welcome, both the demoniac, who in his crazy ways, you're not welcome here, as well as Jesus in his saving ways, you're not welcome here either. But this former mess of a man was now charged to preach Jesus to them. This is an amazing conversion Story and an unexpected missionary situation that comes from all of this. Now, notice also the focus here is not just on the man's change alone. Kind of not like, look at me. His message wasn't, I'm prim and proper now, not no longer naked and bloodied. Look at how wonderful I am. That's not the focus here. The, the focus was the change of his circumstances was because of who? Because of King Jesus and all that Jesus had done for him. If it wasn't for Jesus, he would have continued in his terrible, sad, dark situation. But because of Jesus, this man went from torment and terror to now a delivered, saved Christian. This is a great testimony of the transforming work of 
Jesus. The most unsavable, maybe, man in the history of the world is now saved. He's a believer. Oh, what a blessing. Now, you might be thinking here, this is all well and good, Pastor, and even quite miraculous, and it is, but I don't have any demons, and my unsaved family members and friends and around, they, they don't appear to be demon-possessed either, and you, you're probably right. In most circumstances, you're right. But consider this. If you are a believer, you were once a child of the devil, dead in your trespasses and sins, following the world and the ruler of the world, Satan, and devoid of anything good spiritually. This is the biblical worldview. We saw that recently in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 tells us, though, that God, who is rich in mercy, saved you and all of us, if we're believers, from the demonic realm and evil forces that were one time so influential in your life, blinding you to all the good spiritual things. But when God transformed you, like he transformed the demoniac, you were changed and different, had eyes to see, ears to hear. We all, you see, as Christians, have the same powerful testimony of God making us new and changing us. And notice also from this, and just in reality, that he saved you and he saved us not just to sit there and smile and do nothing, but to be a witness of the great salvation that you've actually experienced, to tell others what Jesus has done with you just like the demoniac was charged to do the same. And if you're a Christian, let me remind you, that is why God saved you, so that it would be evident to all, all that he's done for you. Are you making that evident to those who are around you? And also, for those who are in a tough situation, seemingly unfixable, as we were thinking about earlier, and Maybe you resonated with the overwhelming nature of problems and difficulties um, and, and thought to yourself, it's so messed up or unsolvable or complex or it's just never going to change. I want to also be encouraged, if that's you, I want you to be encouraged that this Jesus who saved the demoniac is the same Jesus who can do wonderful things even in your life with whatever th seems insurmountable. Maybe not taking everything away and just magically poof, making it better overnight, but this Jesus can help you. If he can help the demoniac, don't you see that? He can help you with whatever is going on. And he can also help your unbelieving family members and friends and coworkers and neighbors if you think they're so far gone. He can help them too. So don't give up. The demoniac story and account reminds us that no one is too far gone for God to transform and that God is in the business of saving messed up and destitute people to be an undeniable witness to all that he has done and can do in their lives. So everybody can say, God did that. Clearly, God did that. That's what God is doing. Have hope as it relates to those around you or even your own situation. But even for those who might say that they care less about spiritual things, we talked about this in, in Rick's Sunday School this morning, those people who, you know, all this religious stuff about Jesus, I, I don't really need that. It's really not for them. This is really the majority of unbelievers in all of our lives. Just people, they look fine, they look okay. Uh, they aren't in a graveyard cutting themselves with rocks, possessed by demons. You know, most are going about their life thinking it's all okay and that they just don't need Jesus. They'll say, it's good for you. That's just great for you. But I just don't really need it. It's not needed for me. You know people that are like that. But I want us to consider this right here that this wretch of a man may not have ever really thought much about God or spiritual things or his need before either. In fact, he didn't. Why? Because he was an unbeliever. This guy's an unbeliever. Uh, believers don't get possessed by demons. This was an unbeliever, living his life before the demons, not caring much about God. And then when he's demon-possessed, he didn't know what he needed before he got into the predicament. But the reality is, as we all know with him, he needed Jesus anyway, even though he didn't realize it. But you know what? The, the upstanding, respectable townspeople really needed Jesus too. They weren't as crazy bad off as the demonic. They needed Jesus too. So whether they're the, the upstanding townspeople or it, it, whoever they are, they need Jesus. The demoniac, when he found himself imprisoned and overcome by his own evil and the evil of outside influences in his life through the demons as they came upon him, you see for him, Jesus was his only answer. 
Jesus is and was our only answer as well. Everyone's only answer as well. Why? Because Jesus is mighty and powerful to save even the most lost of sinners and even make them witnesses to the ends of the earth if you would just trust in him. And if you're trusting in him now, that is what he's working and doing in you to those around you. Let's pray in closing. Father, thank you so much for your word and how you save the demoniac. We are so thankful that you save unsavable people. We're thankful for the conversion of this man that day. We pray for more conversions like it. Those who are so far gone and lost and scary to look at, and also those who are self-assured and confident and just completely fine and going about their lives like nothing is wrong. We pray that you would do a work and show them that your son, Jesus, in his dying on the cross and rising again is this gospel hope for them and everybody, the only hope. Would you use the gospel to save lost people all around us? And would you use believers in this room to go and tell all that your son Jesus has done for and through them? We need your help in all these things because without you working, no one is going to be saved. So we just pray for all those on our minds that we love and that we want to be saved. Lord, that we wouldn't give up hope and that we continue to share this good news that saved the demoniac. And we say all this in Christ's name. Amen.